History is a knowledge of the past based upon testimony. Written testimony, oral testimony, and physical testimony. This is how we know anything happened historically. For example, in 1927, did Charles Lindbergh cross the Atlantic in a solo flight? You weren't there, so how do you know that happened? Testimony. In 1945, was the first atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima? We know that through physical testimony, oral testimony, and exhibits, photographs, everything of the event. Another one. In 1969, did Neil Armstrong walk on the moon? The only way you can know there is to examine the testimony, the evidence. Was Jesus Christ raised from the dead? You must examine that historically through testimony. Uh, on September 11, 2001, did some radical terrorists fly planes into the Twin Towers and destroy them? Now, you weren't there probably, so how do you know that happened? Through testimony. Did Jesus Christ claim to be the Son of God? Did George Washington uh, become the President of the United States? The only way we know those things is through testimony. Now, I define history as a knowledge of the past based upon testimony. But the question is, is your testimony reliable? Is it trustworthy? People lie, people cheat, people deceive, people have false memory. Is your testimony reliable? Because every definition has a weakness. And from my definition, is your testimony reliable? Now, when it comes to investigating Christianity, I stated it before, Christianity is a knowledge of the past based upon testimony, mainly the scriptures, uh, the Bible, what people refer to as the Word of God. The question is, is that testimony reliable? Under investigation, can you come to a reasonable conclusion, yes, I can trust the testimony about the Christian faith, about the New Testament, about the Old Testament? This is what I want to look at in a number of segments. What is the testimony and is it reliable? Is it accurate? Is it trustworthy? Can we know historical truth? Are there things in history that are true that we can know today? I think what we need to do is define history. You know, over the last 15, 20 years, I've asked 264 graduate students of history to define history and only six were ever to, able to define history, and two of those were from Biola University out in California. But how in the world can you study history without defining it? Because it determines how you approach history. This is how I define history. I define history as a knowledge of the past based upon testimony. Somebody says, well, I don't believe that. I said, well, do you believe that... Um, uh, Napoleon lived and fought the Battle of Waterloo. Yeah, well, you weren't there. How do you know? Testimony. Now, a knowledge of the past based upon testimony. You have to understand there's three types of testimony in historical investigation. The first is written testimony, that which has been written down about what happened or what was or what is. The second is oral testimony that is passed on from person to person to person orally. And in the ancient times, that's how they were trained. And they were trained to be accurate in the way they related things orally. And then third, there's physical evidence. It would be like um, a fingerprint, a photograph, an author authorized document, uh, configuration of the eyes, whatever is physical testimony. So a knowledge of the past based upon testimony, written testimony, oral testimony, and physical testimony or evidence. This is how we must apply historical investigation to Christianity. You see, the Christian faith, you could say, is a knowledge of the past, of God's intervention in history, Christ's death at the cross, His burial, His resurrection, ascension of the Father, and the sending of the Holy Spirit, based upon testimony, but with a present-day experience. The question is, is it true? You know, the Christian faith is based upon the scriptures, what many people call the Bible or most of us would call the Word of God. 
And here's the issue. If the Word of God, if the Bible is not true, then your faith is false. But the question of the ages is, can you trust the Bible? Is it truly reliable? Is it accurate? Is it the truth? Can you know truth? There was at a very evangelical church, the youth pastor sent me a letter. And at school, they'd ask one of his students, a young lady who was one of his top students, and her parents were deacons and elders in the church and leaders, and they asked her to write a column on truth. And this is what she wrote, and he sent it to me. Listen carefully. What is truth? Is it always the same? I don't think so. Truth changes constantly with time. He, it always varies from person to person and from different circumstances. Then she went on to say, what is true today will not be absolutely true tomorrow. What was truth yesterday is not absolute truth today. Then she concluded, quote, therefore, there is no absolute truth. Now, first thing I would ask, you sure your statement is right? If you say there is no absolute truth, well, that's an absolute statement about truth. But does truth change all the time? You know, around the world, probably the biggest illustration I get is this. Well, of course it changes all the time. I'll say, well, give me an example. Well, people used to believe the world was flat. Now they believe it's round. See, truth changes. I said, wait a minute. That's an example that truth changes? Well, yeah, they used to believe it's flat. Now they believe it's round. I said, let me ask you a question. When people believed the earth was flat, was it actually round? Every single person said, yes. Then when they came to believe the earth was round, had it always been round? Why, well, yes. They said, wait a minute, truth didn't change. Your perspective of truth is what changed. The truth that the earth was round was always true. It's how you perceived it that changed. And what changed it? Two things. They examined the facts. They started with the stars and all. said, wait a minute, there's a curvature to the earth. And then personal experience, they would leave in their ships and they would go all the way around the world. So they concluded the world is round, but it was always round. Say, so, well, Josh, how, how do you tell how old a manuscript is? How can you date it? There, there seems to be such a, a difference in the way people do it. Well, there's five or six basic methods, you could call it, to examine a manuscript. The first is the type of material that is used, uh, from clay to parchment to papyrus. Even how that material was constructed will help to date the manuscript the material was written on. And then the size of the letter and the forms. You see, as they copied manuscripts, even like today, uh, the size of the letters would change, and the way they formed the letter would change down through history. And by looking at the size and the formation of the letter, it helps you to date a manuscript. Then, the punctuation. Uh, there's no, what do you say, uh, supernatural element in the punctuation. There's nothing uh, divine in the punctuation. It was given just letter after letter after letter. And at different times, they would add punctuations, a comma, a period, whatever. And in studying the punctuation, you can often tell what age that manuscript was copied. And then the text division. You know, there's nothing uh, uh, divine about how the chapters are divided or the verses. Uh, originally, they just kind of ran together. And then in order to make it easier to read and easier to teach from, uh, down through the years, they divided it up into chapters and then verses. But often, they changed their division of the text down through the years. And so by studying that division, you could tell if uh, more or less close to what year it was copied. And then ornamentation. Have you ever picked up an old book? And you open it up, and the first page, and often it's the first letter, there's a real fancy piece of art. Uh, or there's a picture there. Uh, 
In ancient manuscripts, they did the same thing. And by studying the ornamentation of the manuscript, you can often, within a few years, determine when that manuscript was copied. I uh, have a lot of books, a lot of old books, all over my house. And one time, I looked over, we had an antique cash register with the books lined up next to it. And I saw this book that looks so old. And I tell you, I don't recall ever buying that book. And I opened it up, and it was a handwritten manuscript uh, going back about, oh, it must have been uh, close to a thousand years. It blew my mind that I even had it sewn together um, with thread. And as I started to try to read it, it was in uh, English. Uh, at the beginning, there was an ornamentation uh, with using the first letter in an artistic uh, display of it. And that would help to date the manuscript. Then another way is the color of the ink. Over the years, the ink, you know, would start to fade. And as they would study at what position it is in fading, they can often help to date a manuscript. These are just some of the ways that they can tell how old a manuscript is. When you examine any document of history, not just the Bible, you apply the bibliographical test. And that test asks questions of the manuscript, which is a handwritten do document. Now, why do they have to ask questions of the manuscripts? For this reason, literature of antiquity was written on material that would perish. And most of it was written on, do you know what ancient paper was called? You're right, papyrus. It was written on papyrus. Papyrus came from the papyri reed grown the shallow waters of the delta of the Nile. They would clip the reeds just below the water, slice them, and they would lay them out to dry. Then they would crisscross the reeds, and in between the reeds they would place a cement or a glue substance, and they would let it dry. And you know, when they let it dry, it became quite a durable uh, piece of paper. In fact, sometimes you could lift it up and almost see through it. But no matter how well it was constructed, it would eventually deteriorate. It would rot away. Uh, and it was according to how long it lasted, according to how much it was involved or exposed to the elements, to heat, to coldness, to the sunlight, would determine how long the papyrus would survive. Then you had the problem with the ink. Uh, they didn't have Parker Brothers back then. They had good ink, but not ink like we have today. But even today, with almost any type of ink, say you write a note to your kids and you leave it on a picnic table outdoors, and it's exposed to the sun. Even with the ink today, what happens to that ink? You're right, it starts to fade. Well, ink in the old days it was used in the manuscripts would start to fade because a lot of times they had to read according to candlelight, so they read outdoors, and it was exposed to the sunlight. So they had to ask certain questions of the manuscripts to see if what you have is what was written down. In other words, here was a problem. You have the original. It's called the autographa, and it would start to rot away. So they do generation number one. Maybe they make 25 copies of it. And then generation number one will start to fade or to deteriorate. They'll make generation number two. Maybe they make 50 copies. And then they make generation number three ad infinitum. And there's two questions they ask about these manuscripts. The first question I'm going to deal with is what's called the timeline. You say, what do you mean the timeline? From the original, how far is the copies that you have removed? See, the rule of thumb is the further they're removed from the original, usually the greater the inaccuracy. Why is that true? Now, you know why. Think, why is that true? Right. Because usually it means it's been copied more. So there was a greater chance of human error in copying the manuscripts. With the New Testament, can we hold it in our hand and say what we have is what was written down? I want to examine that. Whenever you study any document of history, not just the Bible, any historical document, you should apply what's called historiography. Don't let that big word throw you. Historiography. It simply means the principles of determining the authenticity of a document. 
Was it written by who claimed to write it? Is what you have what was written down? Was what was written down in it authentic? Was it true? Now, a part of any good historiography, now this is another big word, is what is called the bibliographical test. Not Bible-graphical, but bibliographical. It's an historical term. The bibliographical test asks questions of the manuscripts. Now, what is a manuscript? Many people say, well, a manuscript is the original. No, the original is called the autographa, autographa, autographa. They'll say, well, it's a copy you have. Well, a manuscript can be a copy that is not necessarily a copy. It can be the original, but it doesn't necessarily mean it is the original. Then what is a manuscript? A manuscript, by definition, is a handwritten copy over against a printed copy. In other words, before the introduction of the movable type printing press in the 1500s. Before then, everything had to be done by hand. Can you imagine? Take the Old Testament. There's over one million consonants. Now don't take the rest of the day counting them. Just trust me. There's over one million consonants. Think how long it would take you or me to conscientiously copy that. A year? Think of how many human errors we would make, leaving out a sentence, leaving out a word, leaving out a phrase, misspelling a word, leaving out a letter. Think of all the dishonest errors. Look, people cheat, people lie. Every generation has their Da Vinci codes. Every generation has a Dan Brown. And so, is it really accurate? When you think of all the human errors, and, uh, and the ones that are purposely done, can you hold the New Testament in your hand and say what I have is what was written down? I'm going to, in the next few sessions, to apply the bibliographical test about the manuscripts to the New Testament. Christianity is a knowledge of the past based upon testimony. Was Christ raised from the dead? Did he claim to be God? Did he heal the sick? All that we know through historical investigation, depending on its testimony. But some people say, look, Josh, you can't know history. You can't know. You can't know history. Then I respond, then you cannot claim then that Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead. If you can't know history, if you say I can't claim he was raised from the dead, then you cannot claim that he wasn't raised from from the dead. So my statement is as valid as your statement if you cannot know history. But I want to examine two questions in these segments together. The first question is this, and these are questions that I had as a non-believer before I ever trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. I set out to write my first book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, now titled The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. I set out to write that against Christianity. I figured any fool could do that and I'd qualify. But in the process, I ended up becoming a Christian. I was driven to it by the facts of history that it is true. And here are the two questions that I had and I want to answer in the next few segments. One, can you hold the New Testament in your hand? And can you say, what I have is what was written down or has it been changed? You know, what people didn't like, they took out. What they did like, they put in. And it looks like it was put together by a committee. Can you, do you have in the New Testament right now what was written down? But the second question was even more important to me. Was what was written down true? Look, if what was written down wasn't true, then I could care less that what I have is what was written down. Was what was written down really true? In other words, did Jesus really say that? Did he really do that? Have you ever been reading the Gospels or whatever, and you just kind of say, oh, wow, that, that's, that's something. Did he really do that? I want to examine those two questions. And almost everything that I share with you are conclusions that I came to before I ever trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. We saw how you date manuscripts. Now, the question is what we have in the New Testament what was written down, or has it been changed? The first question is asked of what we looked at called the bibliographical test is this. What is the timeline? 
How far are the copies that you have removed from the original? You know what I've learned over the years? Oh, I'll tell you. The more I compare the scriptures, the Word of God, with any other literature of antiquity, any other literature, the greater confidence, respect, and admiration I have for the Word of God. Let me show you what I mean. Let me first do it in comparison with others and how their message is how far removed from the original. For example, uh, Pliny the Younger. Maybe you know him as Pliny Segundus. But from the time Pliny Segundus wrote to the closest copy is 750 years, everything else in between has deteriorated or rotted away or faded. Of Caesar and the Gallic Wars, 1,000 years separates it. Of Plato, 1,200 years from the time Plato wrote to the closest copy. Of Aristotle wrote his Poetics, 343 B.C. Do you realize the closest copy is 1100 A.D., 1,400 years removed. Of Euripides, it's 1,500 years. Sophocles, 1,400 years. Of Catullus, 1,600 years. When it comes to the New Testament, we can go back to within 50 years. There's no comparison with any other literature of antiquity. Now, the majority of the manuscripts and the full Gospels and all uh, are probably right around 250 A.D. Uh, starts the majority of the manuscripts. But there's absolutely no comparison with any other literature in antiquity uh, in the time distance from what we have to the closest copy. But the bigger question is this. How many copies do you have? You see, the more copies you have, the easier it is to reconstruct the original, the autographa, autographa, and, and uh, produce what you would call a pure text or a percentage of a pure text. The bibliographical test of any document, we're applying it to the New Testament. And the question is, how many manuscripts do you have? The more manuscripts you have, the easier it is to reconstruct the original. For example, if you have 20 manuscripts, and in those manuscripts you have the Gospel of John, but in John 3, 16, there's three different renderings in those manuscripts. Some translate, for God so loved the world. Some say God thought a lot about the world. And some say God thought the world was cool. How do you know what's in the original? You can't. It's impossible. However, if you have four or five hundred manuscripts, then, oh, it is so much easier to use those manuscripts to recreate the original to a high percentage of a pure text. Again, let me compare the number of manuscripts with other literature of antiquity. For example, Caesar and the Gallic Wars, there's only ten manuscripts that survive. Of Plato, there's only seven manuscripts. Many people consider the Roman historian Tacitus the, the number one Roman historian, and yet there's only 20 manuscripts that remain of his annals. Of Pliny the Younger, seven manuscripts survive. Of Thucydides, eight manuscripts. Suetonius, eight manuscripts. Of the Greek historian Herodotus, there's only eight manuscripts that survive. Everything else is lost. Sophocles, there's 193. Of Lucretius, there is two. Of Euripides, nine manuscripts. Of Demosthenes, there's about 200 manuscripts. Now, Aristophanes, there's only 10, maybe 12 at the most. And Aristotle, only 49 manuscripts. Do you know what there is of the New Testament? Just of the New Testament? I've been able to document 24,633 manuscripts of just the New Testament. I never knew that until I set out to write evidence and demands a verdict against it and found out that I was wrong. I was dumb. The only problem is others were dumber. They made a movie out of that. Dumb and dumber. But in that whole process, I concluded there's absolutely no comparison in numbers between the New Testament and any other book in all of history. Of just the New Testament, there's 24,633 manuscripts. I document those in my book, The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. What they are, where they are, and what they're composed of. But you say, well, how significant is that, 24,000? 
Well, I, I often see the significance of something by making a comparison. So what I want to do is make a comparison between the New Testament and the number two book in all history in manuscript authority by number. Do you know what it is? Do you know, it's, it's not uh, the Old Testament. It's not Harry Potter. Uh, what is the number two book in all history in manuscript authority by number? It's the Iliad by Homer. Now get this, 643 manuscripts. I never knew that. Look at the comparison between number one in all history, the New Testament, 24,633, and number two, the Iliad by Homer, was 643 manuscripts. I have shown in my book how you can take these manuscripts and you can recreate the New Testament that what you have is what was written down to a 99.5% pure text. You can't do that with any other piece of literature historically. I can hold the New Testament in my hand and say what I have is what was written down. Well, let's do a comparison between the New Testament and the Iliad. Here's some stats. A 50-year gap between the New Testament and the autographer. There's a 500-year gap with the Iliad. When it comes to manuscripts, there's 24,633 manuscripts with the New Testament. There's 643 manuscripts with the Iliad. When it comes to a pure text, the New Testament to a 99.5% pure text, and the Iliad to about a 95% pure text. When it comes to the number or words or lines in question, now this is what is amazing, especially with the age of the New Testament. There's only 400 words in the entire New Testament that is in question to what they meant. Do you know what it is for the Iliad, which is so much smaller? 764 lines are in question. Men and women, I can hold the New Testament in my hand. And I can say what I have is what was written down. It has not been changed. But the bigger question is this. Was what was written down true? Now, come on. Did Jesus really do that? Did he really say that? Eyewitnesses are so critical when it comes to understanding anything about history. Dr. Louis Gottschalk, graduate professor of history at uh, University of Chicago, wrote a book, an excellent book called Understanding History. You know why it's so good? It takes the very scholarly, intricate things about understanding history and makes it simple. And in his book, Understanding History, Louis Gottschalk says this, The ability to tell the truth rests in part upon the witness's nearness to the event. Nearness is here used in both the geographical in a chronological sense. Now, what does that mean? Well, geographical means in physical presence. In other words, the closer to the event you are physically, the better. And in chronological, time-wise. The closer you are time-wise to the event, usually the greater the accuracy. In other words, if you were an eyewitness. You know, in the New Testament, they were so concerned about truth. And with the apostles, they would say, well, how do you know Jesus said that? How, how do you guys really know he did that? Just like we ask today in the New Testament church, they were asking that because they were so committed to truth. And so John gives an answer to them of how he had a confidence that what they were saying about what Jesus said and Jesus did was true. And this is in 1 John 1 in verses 1 to 3. Now look, you, you possibly have read it many times, but most people kind of skip over it because it doesn't seem to be any substance there. But what is there is far more important than a lot of the substance. What is there? John is telling how he and the other apostles had confidence about what Jesus said and did. Listen to what he said. What we have heard with our own ears, not with somebody else, what we have heard with our own ears, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have handled with our hands, we declare unto you. In other words, he was saying, look, we were eyewitnesses. We were there. We all heard him say this. We heard him do this. And Jesus wouldn't say something just once. He'd say it over and over and over again. 
And so he said, look, we have a confidence in what we're saying because our ears heard it, our eyes saw it, and our hands handled it. You can't get much closer to a person or an event in history to record what happened than what the apostles did with Jesus.